Today I want to share with you how to make roast turkey bone broth on the stovetop. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. The first thing I want to mention is that any time you want to jump ahead, be sure to check the timestamps below in the description as well as in the pinned comment. And also in the description and the pinned comment, I'll have a link to the printable recipe. Well, whether you make a turkey for Thanksgiving or Christmas or any time of year, you always want to remember to save the carcass and any other bones and scraps that are left over. And then using the carcass and scraps, we're going to turn this into the most glorious gelatinous roast turkey bone broth you've ever had. Now, when you make any kind of bone broth, you always want to be sure to be adding in some vegetables because it's from the vegetables that you're going to increase the mineral content of your bone broth. Now what I've got here are carrots, celery, and yellow onions, but you can use pretty much anything you want. And as you've often heard me say, this can be a great time to clean out your crisper, your vegetable crisper, and see if you have any vegetables that are getting a little close to their prime. Those are perfect for using when making bone broth. And you don't have to peel anything, including the onions. Onion skins are as nutritious as the onions themselves. So even if you're making another recipe where you're peeling your onions, be sure to put these in a scrap bag and save them in your freezer until you're ready to make bone broth. Now these carrots are peeled, but as I said, you don't have to peel anything. Everything has nutrition. Now the reason these are peeled was because I was using them in another recipe. And I actually have more carrots than I would normally put into a bone broth. I might just use about three or any carrot scraps that I have around the house, around the house or in my fridge or freezer. But since I had these and they were getting a little close, as I said, a little, little, almost a little past their prime, uh, I figured I'm just going to throw them all in because the more the merrier. The more, vi the more vegetables you have, the more minerals and vitamins you have. And then with the celery, I always save the root, like the very bottom of the celery, and I just quarter it to make it easy for the nutrients to be extracted when it's simmering in the bone broth. And then I've just got a little extra celery here. Then I'm just going to add in two onions and I've just quartered them or I've cut them in half and then quartered each half. Now you can also add in garlic if you like. I really don't like adding garlic to bone broth because bone broth simmers longer than just a broth or a stock and I find that the flavor of the garlic on such a long simmer can become a little off-putting. I would rather leave it out and then add garlic to any soup or stew or whatever, the, whatever I'm making where I'm using the bone broth and I want to add in that garlic flavor. Then what I've got over here are a couple of bay leaves and about a half a teaspoon or so of black peppercorns. Now I generally don't add any salt when I'm making bone broth and that's also to give me flexibility later on depending on how I'm using the bone broth, but I especially don't use salt when I'm making any type of roast poultry bone broth. And the reason is when I was roasting the poultry, I was probably using salt, pepper, maybe other seasonings as well. So I definitely don't want to add any salt when I'm getting ready to use the scraps that may have some salt on them to make the bone broth. Now today we're making roast turkey bone broth on the stovetop but I have a very extensive playlist of bone broths where I show you how to make all different types, beef, chicken, turkey, pork, fish, and I show you how to make them in all sorts of different ways, both in the slow cooker, the stove top, and also the instant pot. And I've got them all in a playlist for you, so I'll be sure to link to that. Now, speaking of poultry bone broths, as I said, we're gonna make roast turkey bone broth. You can also make roast chicken bone broth. You can make roast duck bone broth. You can make roast goose bone broth. Even if you make little rock cornish hens that look like little individual turkeys to serve everyone, you can use those bones to make a roast rock cornish hen bone broth. And as you approach holiday time, if you wanna learn how to make a roast duck or a roast goose 
or raw Cornish hens. I have videos and printable recipes on how to make all of those things and I'll be sure to link to them. Now the other thing that you're going to need is some type of acid and that's to acidulate the water in which we're going to simmer our turkey carcass and scraps. Now why do we want to acidulate our water, which means to add an acid to the water? The reason is bones and cartilage contain collagen and acid helps to extract that collagen from the bones and the cartilage. And it's that collagen that when cooked becomes gelatin. And that what, that's what makes our bone broth very gelatinous once it's cooled. And why do we want a high gelatin bone broth? The reason is the gelatin is very soothing to our digestive system. And the more we can soothe and keep healthy our digestive system, the better we are able to absorb nutrients from all of our foods. And the better we're able to absorb nutrients from all of our foods, the healthier we are. Now when I make any type of bone broth, I generally like to use a fortified wine to acidulate my water. And when it comes to poultry bone broths, I really like to use white vermouth. But today I'm going to do something a little different. And what I'm going to share with you, which is important to know, especially if you don't like to use alcohol in your cooking, is that when you go to acidulate the water, you have options. You can use vinegar and you can also use any type of citrus. The difference is when you use a fortified wine, like a white vermouth, you can use about a cup. The alcohol will simmer off and you'll be left with the flavor of the vermouth. But when you use a different type of acid, like a vinegar or a citrus juice, which are stronger in flavor, you want to limit the amount that you use. In the case of vinegar, you want to use a quarter of a cup. And if you use citrus like lemon or lime juice, you want to use about two tablespoons. Now today what I'm going to use is a homemade vinegar. And the reason that I'm using this vinegar, which I generally don't use because I find it can sometimes have a little bit of a sharp flavor. That's why I tell you to really pull back on how much you use, just a quarter of a cup. But I thought it would be fun to use this homemade vinegar because this is a cranberry apple homemade vinegar. And given that this was a Thanksgiving turkey and I'll be using the bone broth between Thanksgiving and Christmas, I thought it would be fun to maybe have some of that little bit of cranberry flavor infused into my bone broth. And if you want to learn how to make homemade fruit scrap vinegars like this that are raw and rich in probiotics, the good bacteria for good gut health, I'll be sure to link to a playlist where I have lots of homemade vinegars. And last but not least, we got the star of the show, our turkey carcass. Plus all the bones attached to the carcass and all the various scraps that I was able to save. What I do is pull off as much good meat off of the turkey as I can. And then I simply start putting everything into a scrap bag and saving it for when I'm ready to make bone broth. And I especially like having the wing tips because these are very high in collagen. And I also have the neck, which I've cut up into pieces. This is also very high in collagen. And I always like making sure that I've got some of the bones that still have the cartilage in place because the cartilage on these bones, the joints at the, where the bones join either to uh, other bones or to the main carcass of the turkey, these are very high in collagen as well. So the more uh, we've got in here that's high in collagen, the better. Now what I've got for making this roast turkey bone broth on the stovetop is a stock pot. And this is a 10 quart stock pot. I find this is a great size for making beef bone broth as well as making turkey bone broth uh, because it's a sufficient size to be able to hold the carcass and all the scraps. So I'm going to go ahead and just add these scraps and carcass. I've broken the carcass into smaller pieces. We'll just get all of that out and into my stock pot. Now on top of my carcass and scraps, I'm going to go ahead and add in my vinegar. Now I'm going to go ahead and cover all of this with some water, but just to cover. That's the one thing you always want to be careful whenever you're making any kind of bone broth is you don't want to use too much water because that will dilute the gelatin. 
Now it's not the end of the world if you dilute the gelatin, but you would need to drink more bone broth to get the results of a smaller amount of bone broth in which the gelatin was not diluted. Now generally I always recommend using some type of filtered water is probably the best uh, because we are going to be simmering this and there'll be some concentration. Uh, so if you have tap water that you think may be very high in chemicals, you may want to avoid that. But I'll go ahead and put some water in here now and I will show you to what level I cover the bones. Now as you'll see everything's covered really by no more than an inch or so of water and that's sufficient. Now if a few bones or scraps float to the top don't worry about that at all. But what we're going to do now is I'm just going to put the lid on this and I'm going to let this sit here for an hour and simply soak in the acidulated water. This will jumpstart the process of helping to extract all that wonderful collagen from the bones and the cartilage. Well, I've let these bones soak in the acidulated water for about an hour. Now what I'm going to do is take these over to my stovetop. I'm going to turn the heat up to high, bring this up to a boil. The minute it comes up to a boil, I'm going to turn it down to the lowest setting and I'm going to skim off any of the foam or sometimes it's referred to as scum that comes to the top of the water. Now the temperature management when you're making bone broth, any type of bone broth is very important and you want to keep a close eye on this when you bring it up to a boil because the minute you see it come up to a boil you really need to immediately turn it down to low. You never want to allow bone broth to boil for any extended period of time because that serves only to, for lack of a better expression, I often use the term, break the gelatin. The only reason we bring it up to a boil is to just allow some of that foam to float to the top. That sometimes contains impurities and if we uh, allow that to surface up to the top and can skim it off, we will also have a clearer, nicer finished product. Now when we bring this down to the lowest setting on our stovetop, what we're looking for is being able to maintain a temperature of approximately 180 degrees Fahrenheit because that is the temperature that bone broth and specifically gelatin loves to be cooked at. Anything lower is just generally not considered food safe and anything higher is considered not to be liked by the gelatin. Now what if you don't have a thermometer? And you know I'm not going to tell you to go buy any particular kitchen product like a thermometer or a scale or any of that. I always like to share with you tips for how to tell what the temperature is of something without using some type of device. Generally simply having your bone broth on the lowest setting on your stovetop is going to be perfect. But just in case you're not sure, what you're looking for are little bubbles coming up kind of like every few seconds. I've often described it as bloop, bloop, bloop like that. Then you know you've got the perfect temperature. Now do you leave your bone broth covered or uncovered as it's simmering? Generally you want to leave it uncovered as it simmers because you do want to allow for some evaporation, some concentration of your bone broth. Generally what I like to do is just put the lid on ever so gently and just have it somewhat tilted to allow for evaporation and then to also allow my stove fan to help remove some of the aroma of the bone broth. Now I don't mind the aroma at all, but I know that many of you who are new to making bone broth sometimes can find that it just fills your house, not just your kitchen, but fills your house with the aroma of bone broth that may not be pleasing to everyone. So doing something like this where you have your lid tilted, you've got your stovetop fan on, it will help take some of that out of your kitchen, out of your home, and send it to the outside and your neighbors are going to wonder what deliciousness you're simmering on your stovetop. Now you may be wondering about the vegetables, the peppercorns, and the bay leaves. We will be adding those in, but we want to bring this up to a boil first. 
We want to skim off any foam that comes to the top and then we're going to add in all of our vegetables, the peppercorns and the bay leaves and everything will be mixed well. I'll use like a wooden spoon, whatever you've got will, is fine. Mix everything together and then let everything simmer. Now, how long do we let our turkey bone broth simmer? And for that matter, how long do we let any poultry bone broth simmer? The good news is poultry bone broth only needs to be simmered for about six hours. Now, I know you might be saying, six hours, what are you talking about? Everybody says 24, 36, 48, 72, you know, all these long hours of simmering. But in reality, all you really need is about six hours. And if you've not had a chance to read the book Nourishing Broth by Sally Fallon Morell, I highly recommend it. In her book, she discusses why it's actually beneficial to simmer bone broths, all types of bone broths, including beef bone broth, which should only be simmered for about 12 hours, why simmering bone broths for shorter times is actually better than longer times. And the reasons that she shares is number one, there's less chance of breaking the gelatin with a shorter simmer than a longer simmer, but also there's less chance of any fat that may be being released from the carcass or the bones or whatever the case may be, whatever you're using, there's less chance of the fat developing any rancidity and then giving your bone broth obviously a very off flavor. So this makes making bone broth a lot easier than we ever thought it would be. Whether you simmer it on the stove or in a slow cooker, you just need six hours. And if you do it in an instant pot, you only need two hours on the low setting. Now, what if after the six hour simmer, you find that your carcass or the cartilage on some of your bones hasn't dissolved completely? No problem. Just pick those out. I always do this after my bone, after I've decanted my bone broth and I have all the scraps left over, I look through everything. And if I find that there's still some cartilage available that hasn't in essence melted or dissolved during the simmering process, I save those bones and I put them in my scrap bag in the freezer and they get added to my next batch of poultry bone broth. So a six hour simmer is all you need for a beautifully gelatinous and flavorful bone broth. Well, let me go ahead and put this on my stovetop. Well, this is simmered for six hours. Now I'm gonna use my spider strainer. You can also use a slotted spoon. Whatever you have will do great. And you're just gonna to wanna to start to take out all of the bones and the vegetables and transfer them to a bowl. Now set your scraps aside, and once they cool a little to the point where you can handle them, look through everything and see if there are any bones that still have some cartilage on them that hasn't melted, so to speak, as the bone broth was simmering. If you find anything like that, you can definitely put those into a scrap bag for future bone broths. For the most part, the vegetables have had a lot of their nutrition, a lot of their vitamins and minerals extracted out from them over the time that it was simmer over the time that they were simmering. So they're probably considerably less nutritious, but you could certainly fish those out as well if you wanted, puree them and use them to maybe thicken a soup, something like that. Some folks have shared with me that they rinse the vegetables very well to make sure that there's no lingering fat or protein on them, and they'll actually compost them. I have not tried that, but that's something worth researching. Now, when it comes to decanting roast turkey bone broth, or any bone broth for that matter, we have options. Something that's very easy to do is to simply let your stock pot cool down a little bit, and you can put this right into your refrigerator and let it cool. What you'll find after about 12 hours is that the fat will have floated to the top. You can remove that fat, save it of course to use for cooking, and then you're gonna see your beautiful gelatinous bone broth underneath. And you can decant that into any type of vessel you want to store it, either in your refrigerator or in your freezer. And then there'll be a little bit of the bits and bobs of debris that will have sunk down to the bottom and you can either discard that 
or some people like to mix it with a little water and puree it, make like a little bit of a cream soup from it. There's a lot of options, but that's probably one of the easier ways when it comes to decanting your bone broth. However, I like to do something that's a little more involved, but I feel the little bit of work associated with it allows me to have a beautifully clarified bone broth that I can then store in my refrigerator or in my freezer. And it's ready very nicely to be used in place of water for cooking grains or as a base for soups and stews or to make gravy, what, in whatever way I want to use it. And you might be asking, but Mary, that just sounds very similar to just simply putting the stock pot in the refrigerator. To a certain extent it is, however, you do lose some of your bone broth to the bottom where all the little bits and bobs are de of debris are. So I find straining the bone broth this way that I'm going to show you in a minute uh, allows me to capture more of the bone broth. Now I'm going to show you how I like to go ahead and decant this, but I just want to mention that some people do like keeping the, the fat in their bone broth. They'll use it just as a sipping broth and they enjoy having the mouthfeel and the added nutrition of the fat. And you can certainly do that and we'll talk about how to do that. However, I like to have a more clarified bone broth. I like just the bone broth and then I like to keep the fat separate for cooking. Now I certainly enjoy bone broth as a sipping broth, but one that has been defatted. Now in order to get a really nice, clear, clarified bone broth, what I like to do is get some type of bowl or, or heat proof pitcher, whatever you have. I've got this big glass measuring cup and then I like to get a mesh strainer and then I like to use a flour sack towel and I'll line the flour sack towel, I'll line the mesh strainer with the flour sack towel that's going to catch all the little bits and bobs of debris. But what I'm going to do is first I'm going to wet my flour sack towel because this way it'll be less likely to absorb a lot of the bone broth that I'm going to be pouring through here. Well I've got my wet flour sack towel and I've wrung it out really well and I kind of start in one corner more or less because I'll move the flour sack around as the debris starts to build up and sometimes as the debris starts to build up it prevents a real nice flow of the bone broth so then I'll just start moving it little by little and that helps considerably. Now there's not a lot in here because we just did we're not dealing with a lot of liquid like when we make a beef bone broth or we use the carcass of three chickens to make a chicken bone broth. So I think I can pick this up and carefully uh, pour it through here. So hopefully I can do a good job. Well, as you'll see, I get a lot of buildup of debris and I just keep moving the cloth along a little bit. You'll see it's quite uh, covered with a lot of the different debris that tends to develop it when you make bone broth that you're not able to 100% get out with the strainer. Well, I've completely emptied my stock pot of the liquid and it looks like I've done really well here. I've got over four cups of roast turkey bone broth. And to think of how many folks will just throw that carcass out. And here you can have all of this wonderful good nutrition. So it makes me very happy. But you'll see why I like to use the flour sack towel, how much debris I've been able to filter out of this. Now we've got our strained roast turkey bone broth. You will notice as it's sitting here in this large measuring cup and it's starting to cool a bit that the fat has floated to the top and is beginning to congeal a bit. You can even see if you look closely on the side here the little bit of fat layer. So now we have two options. We can go ahead and decant it just as is, or we can defat it. If you want to decant this as it is, then you can go ahead and put it in, I usually like a half gallon jar if I'm going to refrigerate it. And if I think I may not be using it right away, then I will leave the fat in place because the fat cap, as I call it, will help insulate your bone broth and it'll keep it a little fresher in your refrigerator, maybe up to two weeks, but always use the sniff test. 
and make sure that it's, it, it smells nice and that it looks nice, not overly cloudy and things like that that may indicate some spoilage. If I think I'm going to use this within a week's time, then I will defat it and I'll just have my bone broth ready to use in whatever way I want. Now the same goes for if I want to freeze my bone broth. Usually I will always defat it in that case and then I really like using these type of jars. I think they're called uh, either uh, French jelly jars or French working glasses, something like that. But what I like about them is they have these little plastic lids. Now I always try to leave uh, at least an inch headspace to allow for expansion. But if for any reason I mess up a little bit and the bone broth expands past what the cap allows because it's plastic and it's just on, you know, you just pop it on. All, what hap all that happens when the bone broth expands is that the lid pops off. So I find it to be a lot safer uh, than canning jars that may have, you know, the lid in the ring. So that's something to think about. But what we're going to do today, I'm going to show you how I like to defat my bone broth. And I'm going to go ahead and store it in this half gallon jar because I'll definitely be using this over the next few days. I have leftover turkey, so I'm planning like a nice turkey barley soup and various other things and it'll go very quickly. But I love this device. Now I've shared this in many of my bone broth videos and I know those of you who have one also have told, told me it's a complete game changer when it comes to making bone broth. If you like to defat your bone broth, all you have to do is go ahead and we'll have to do this in batches and we'll go ahead and we'll just pour our bone broth through the top here. Now the top does have grates uh, or perforations that would catch some debris, but I always find I like to uh, strain my bone broth through the, the flour sack towel first. And you could also use cheesecloth if you prefer that, uh, but it doesn't really hold up after one or two, tr who, two, one or two tries, one or two rinses. Uh, whereas my flour sack towels, they last forever. And I'll just give this a real good rinse and then I'll wash it with a fragrance-free uh, detergent and a little bit of vinegar and it'll stay beautiful. The holes on this fat separator, as you see, are fairly large, not, not even as tight as a mesh strainer. So it wouldn't catch all those little uh, bits and bobs of debris. Uh, but it is something for you to keep in mind. Now, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna let this sit for a few minutes and you're gonna let all the fat rise up to the top. Now, when you make beef bone broth, you're going to see a lot more fat. You might even see a half inch or an inch at the top here. But whenever you make a poultry bone broth, you don't see as much fat, but you do see a little. So you've got, as I showed you when it was sitting in the measuring cup here, there was a small line of uh, turkey fat, and then you'll be able to see a small line of turkey fat here in the fat separator. And how this works is you let the fat float to the top, then there's a little lever here. And when you press this lever, it opens the little hole on the bottom. And then you just go ahead and you watch as your bone broth uh, is in the process of being defatted, goes down into your jar. And when you see the fat getting closer to the bottom, you just stop and then you decant your fat into some other type of container and save that later for cooking. Look at this, it's so easy. So I'm just gonna keep straining this bone broth into my jar and as you see, we're getting closer and closer to where the fat is and when it hits right there towards the bottom, I'm gonna stop. And now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna decant my fat into a different container. Now I'll just go ahead and finish straining the fat out of my turkey bone broth, my roast turkey bone broth, and then we'll see how much we're able to fill this jar with. Well, I've got my turkey fat here, which I'll save for cooking, and then I've got this magnificent, more than half a gallon of roast turkey bone broth. And a little extra I put here, it's still warm, so this is my cook's treat. Now, when you put this in your refrigerator, without the fat cap, it's going to stay fresh for one week. If you left the fat cap in here, it'd stay fresh for about two weeks. 
Plus, when you do chill this and then open this cap, you are going to see the most glorious gelatinous bone broth, and that's just what you're looking for. Now, if you'd like to learn how to make more turkey bone broth in different vessels like the Instant Pot and the Slow Cooker, as well as how to make all types of bone broth, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a whole playlist that covers everything from start to finish. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country Kitchen. Love and God bless.